Today is Friday, March 22nd, 2024, and you have found the Living Youth Podcast. I'm here once again with my podcast co-host and partner, Mr. Wallace Smith. Mr. Smith, what happened to spring? <laughs> I know. it's a, I've been so looking forward to spring because my, my big thing, my wife likes changing seasons. I just like to be comfortable all the time. I don't care if it's too hot or too cold. I like to be comfortable. I guess if I have to default, I'll default to too hot because of Texas background. I'm more used to it. But yeah, today's today's a bit chilly. I've yeah. been enjoying the real temperate weather we've had recently. I have a very conscious switch that gets flipped when it's time for spring. Mm-hmm. And you don't can't flip it too early because then you'll just get depressed when it gets <laughs> cold again. And so I flipped it way too early this year. And I'm like... I'm I'm not here for a dingy, rainy, cold day. Yeah, it's not raining yet, but it's supposed to rain later. Okay, the, the rain will actually make me feel happier. I like I like rain, even if it's cold rain. I like rain, hmm. unless I got to be in it, then that's miserable. Right, it's a life or death situation at that <laughs> point. What do we have up for discussion today? Well, today we we thought we'd we'd talk about sort of a different topic. Uh, well, there's various forms of entertainment out there. We're not here to evaluate them all or not, but. Uh, because with the recent um, movie uh, Dune making waves in theaters, a lot of people are talking about it. We're not going to talk about that so much. It might come up as one example, but it kind of got us thinking science fiction as a genre is worth making sure we keep our biblical heads about us. So today we're going to talk about the pros and cons of science fiction. Sounds great. Let's do it. Welcome back. And again, you have found the Living Youth Podcast. We hope you're happy about that. We're certainly happy about it. And today we are going to talk about science fiction, the pros and cons. There are many genres out there of fiction that people indulge in here and there. Uh, I know fans of Jane Austen and Pride and Prejudice or uh, Anne of Green Gables. Mr. Robinson, I'm sure you were an Anne of Green Gables no. fan. Okay, I like Jane Austen. Did you? Oh, there you go. I know. I actually think my wife grew up reading a lot of uh, Little House on the Prairie and stuff. I actually, in in high school English, did not mind reading a lot of those books that they had you read back then. The only one I distinctly did not enjoy was um, Wuthering Heights. Oh, didn't like yeah. it at all. Is that Charlotte Bronte or? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, Wuthering Heights, uh, Heathcliff, and all that. Yeah, I just found terrible. just depressing and awful. That's right. Well, but, I mean, I'm not. It's. I'm sure it's beautifully written. I did not care for the story. <laughs> And just to be clear, those are not in the science fiction genre. They right? they are not. Mm-hmm. I'm sure these days there's science fiction versions. Uh, versions. I know they've got like a, a Jane Austen zombies book and, and oh, other things. So I'm sure there's yeah. things out there. However, we are not, dear listeners, teens and young adults, here to talk about uh, entertainment on a broad way. That could be an interesting episode. Rather. We want to focus. We want to find, and I will say, and I think we should wrap up. The advice that I hope we can wrap up with is advice like Mr. O'Gwen gave more broadly with entertainment in general, that when you're trying to understand what should I allow myself to be entertained by keeping in mind Philippians four, eight about uh, what we allow, what's good and what's noble, et cetera. I think in my notes, I wrote Philippians two, eight. Let's yep. ignore that. Mr. Robinson, well, Philippians well, four, I eight. I wasn't going to bring it up. No, you're so good. Uh, but regardless, we want to focus on science fiction in general. You know, if you're out there and you're trying to think about, uh, Oh, you know, I just have a little time. I'd like to watch something with my friends. Uh, we want to talk about science fiction as a genre in general. This is not going to be, in fact, it is definitely not an endorsement of any particular movie or franchise or book series, though I think Mr. Robinson and I probably can say I've, I've consumed quite a bit of science fiction and, and definitely including my misspent youth. Uh, Mr. Robinson, I think I know you've exposed some science I, fiction. I read a lot in my high school age and into my 20s, and I, I kind of didn't a whole lot after well, I got married and started having kids. And, uh, <laughs> that I might actually, relate to one of our points. I I read less science fiction and more what what would be considered in the fantasy genre. Right, right. And some of those principles that we're going to talk about today certainly will apply kind of in that direction as well. But with those things in mind, it's very important. We're going to bring out Disclaimer Guy because we want to make it very plain that we may talk about things we've been exposed to, but we're not endorsing 
any of these things. So disclaimer guy, please come on out of wherever we store you from time to time and, uh, and help all of us out and make sure it's plain to our listeners. Any discussion that follows should not be considered an endorsement of the subject of that discussion. Unless the subject is the Bible. We endorse that big time. Thank you, Disclaimer Guy. We sure appreciate that. Uh, Always, especially our teens out there, make sure you're talking with your parents and don't just go diving into the world, what the world has to offer you in terms of entertainment. Because the world, spoiler alert, is a terrible place. And the things that they want to offer you for entertainment uh, can often be terrible. So do make sure you're not just making those decisions on your own. And not only that, there's actually a lot of active agendas out there to sway your 100%. And in fact, we'll, we'll probably talk about a few of those maybe as we go over these things. Well, you know, because it, it reminds me how we, we tend to think, well, I, you know, I, I've got my head on straight and I, you know, they can't sway me. And I'm like, well, they spend millions of dollars on one 30 second commercial in the Super Bowl and they don't do that because it doesn't work. You know, the. Exactly. That I, that's what when people try to tell me that uh, oh television's dead or commercials don't work, it's like you know there is no way these people actually care about their money. They are not just throwing away their money. They are investing because they know it makes a difference. So yeah, we're going to talk about probably some of those. So here's how we've kind of organized our discussion. I think I've got a number wrong here in my notes. We're going to talk about one at least one pro of science fiction, like science fiction as a a genre, you know, some worthwhile things that can actually be done with that, which are interesting. And then three cons, that is three more negative sides of science fiction as a genre that if you're going to keep your biblically thinking brain engaged, you want to keep these things in mind. So ready to dive in, Mr. Robinson? I am. All right. Okay. The first one that this is kind of a pro, at least I can say that it, it was for me. Uh, there is a lot of great storytelling potential for making you think. Now, I don't just mean great storytelling uh, potential because some people justify the worst of garbage and say, oh, but it's a compelling story. Well, you know what? I don't need no. a story that's going to no. mess me over and make me think terrible things. I mean a good storytelling potential in terms of actually making you think, making you consider some aspect of life and either imagine it in a different context in a way that that removes distractions or even focuses you on it in a particular kind of way Am I, does that make sense at all mr robinson yep. what, what I'm yeah saying? no absolutely i when i was younger i i had very little um i, I was not very discerning about what i watched Some things I avoided, but in general, I didn't hesitate to watch, you know, some kind of, you know, violent action movie. But then, but then as I got older, I, I, I found I couldn't justify watching certain things, especially if they rose above a certain level. And, and I, I don't watch nearly as much as many movies as I used to back in the day, because even if it's a really interesting, compelling story, as you said, that doesn't mean it's, it's good for me. It doesn't mean it, it you know, I remember very specifically, Audrey and I had had, it was not by design, but we hadn't seen a movie in like over a year. And it had something to do with us raising raising one of our kids. And like Ella had some health struggles when she was younger and it might have been that. But we watched a relatively innocuous movie and I kept thinking about it and dreaming about it that night. Like really? I, I almost feel like that because I'd been away from it so long that seeing the movie again sort of I was more sensitive and and that that it did have an impact on me and it wasn't even anything that was like really I I wouldn't imagine being too controversial no that that's actually very interesting it reminds me uh, uh, my wife can be Jeanine can be very similar in terms of what she watches it I actually kind of appreciate the larger sensitivity because what we watch actually impacts all of us. It always impacts us. I that's part of the theme of uh, I can't remember the the split sermon I gave uh uh, about fake world. I need to remember the exact title, but regardless, I'll, maybe I'll look it up. Maybe that'd be a good link to add on, on living but it impacts all of us. But I appreciate folks like, like my wife who are sensitive enough that they're aware, they're far more consciously aware of how they're being affected by things. It, I, what's more dangerous when you don't know, right. And we'll even get into some of that, but in terms of a positive example, let me give one. 
I remember reading, this is actually not like a whole novel or something. It was really just a science fiction short story in a magazine that, that, uh, a science oriented magazine that I used to, used to get, doesn't exist anymore. It's my understanding. But when I was younger, uh, there was a magazine and it was, they, they, they kind of focused what they considered speculative science. They really enjoyed talking about different things and they had a short story. It was fictionalized. It certainly was not real because and that's why it was science fiction. Not only was it fiction, but it focused on science, but it presented this scenario where say you had a fella who, uh, an older individual perhaps who was dying of some degenerative disease. That is he, it was, it was definitely some sort of fatal disease. He knew he was going to die and they have precious little time to try to, what do they do about that? So in the, in the story, they imagined that there was a device that could be uh, implanted on his skull that he would just wear, where all these sort of, uh, optic type fibers would, would be placed in his corpus callosum. That's the space between your left and right brain hemispheres. And what would happen is uh, this is again, total fiction, but it was attached to a computer or something that as he wore it day by day over however long it took, it would learn how his brain was thinking. And cause it's, it's getting all the signals that are bouncing around there amongst your neurons. And then as it kind of mastered certain things, like I would say in an AI context now that it, it's knowing it's making predictions that are coming true constantly, it would actually take over the role of some neurons. Like if there's a signal coming, that's going to go to one neuron. Well, the machine knows it's mastered that neurons response. And so it intercepts the signal and acts like the neuron. So it's, it's kind of like having an artificial limb, but instead you're getting an artificial neuron, but then over time it begins taking over more and more of those neurons jobs. Again, learning how you, you know, those neurons can't say you, that's, that's the difference. Learning how those neurons respond is just behaving again, kind of like having an artificial limb and that artificial limb is responding exactly like you would to like, like your regular limb would to all your signals. Well then over a course of time, it's replacing things one neuron at a time until by the time before this individual dies in the story, He's not even using his neurons anymore. It's just simply the computers, it's the artificial neurons to the point that he doesn't even need his brain anymore. It's been completely sort of, you know, kind of taken over in this. And then of course he dies, but now again, science fiction, he, he didn't need that anymore. He's his whole consciousness, if you will, is now inside the computer, mm -hmm. which then allows him to continue living forever in this fantasy digital realm. The but, transhumanists love that. Story. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure they did. Well, but it, it captured my imagination and, and made me think it's kind of like if you imagine, well, so you had a, a broken finger, so you replaced it with a dig, a, a mechanical finger, but as long as it operated just like your finger, you, but then more and more of your body gets replaced. Well, in a science fiction context, we kind of give it, it's like, well, look, as long as I still got my brain, right? You know, my brain, I'm, I'm still me. I'm just stuck in, but then it's like, well, what if you did have, begin to have artificial neurons, you, but you had something that could replace a neuron is misfiring. So you replace it with another neuron, but then over time you replace it with more and more until next thing you know, your whole brain is just an artificial neuron. Well, it, it sparked in me kind of this kind of thought and, and just internal dialogue about, well, how does the spirit in man interact with the brain? Because I personally, I believe that would go wrong somewhere, right? And it's not just our technological capabilities that God didn't intend for things to go in that direction. Well, plus, is it even you anymore? Exactly. exactly. So I'd wonder is at what point would it seem like not you, but it, it, it brought up quite, I would say it made a good conversation between me and my wife, but it was a terrible conversation between me and my wife. We, uh, I, this is early in our marriage and you're still learning each other a little <laughs> bit. And so I, I want to bring up this, this thing to talk about it, like a, a sound box kind of, I mean, a soundboard just sort of, and so I'm presenting thoughts and then she's responding and I'm, I'm, part of my Myers-Briggs personality is to, to take the other side, even against myself to try mm -hmm. to explore my idea. And so I'm doing that thing was like, well, yeah, but what about this? And what about that? And, you know, from her perspective, it was just like me just shutting down every argument she possibly had. And we learned quickly, these are not the kind of conversations that really <laughs> invest in our marriage. Well, so anyway, I, I, but yeah, you learn each other, yeah, right? Yeah, so, sure. and so in that regard, but, but I did, it did actually get me thinking more about the spirit in man, how it is that, that the mind actually works and interacts. And it's, it's just 
it's fiction, but it, it brought up, I thought, an interesting question. It reminds me of, of a movie I saw on a plane. Did you see, or you may not see, but the, the Johnny Depp movie uh, where essentially he's dying and they do something similar and he gets uh, replaced by some kind of artificial intelligence uh Edward Something. Scissorhands? No, it's not Edward Scissorhands. <laughs> no, but, I don't know what that well, is. Well, it, it, I can't write. It's, it's not transcendence. Uh, it's it's, it's, it's kind of like this idea. Well, anyway, regardless, it, okay. I remember seeing the trailers thinking, oh, this is going to talk about very similar things. Is is he actually duplicated inside this machine? And and being trapped on a plane and seeing it end up, uh, it was kind of, I don't know, it, it was not profound or deep mm -hmm. at all. I didn't, if you had didn't some time to waste on a plane, was a good way to do it? Well, I tell you, so you're on those planes, you can just be completely trapped. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, they're on the back of your uh seat and yeah. so you know you, you well, you're not strapped flight you um we're way off the reservation here okay <laughs> but do they have a place where you just put your phone up there oh I've and seen then that. you can access their their kind of in, their intranet website and then it has all these different movies and tv shows you can watch you too. know how they have the sick bag the bag on uh -huh. every plane in case you have to get sick and it's got the little wire so you can close it up mm -hmm. i've learned to fold those origami like into a holder for my phone on my tray that i felt i thought i should that's actually awesome yeah thanks you okay you show have me that later that'll be in that <laughs> I'll, show, I'll show you <laughs> that'll be in the link below the links below uh, yeah not really <laughs> so, but you were going to say something far more worthwhile what was it Hmm, I don't, it was about the neuron remember, replacement thing, or I, I feel like I accidentally started talking. Did I flush it out of your brain? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't remember thinking I was about. What to make it was a okay, point. really okay. I thought I saw something on your face that made you think of something uh, you were going to say. Well, there's a bunch of different directions you could. Oh, I, I, I do know what I was going to say. I was going to say, and that I would argue there's even there's a, very much a difference between modern sci-fi and like 50 sci-fi you know mm -hmm. an older sci-fi mm -hmm. that it back then it still was a little more like could you see this potential that's ahead of us all these things we can do and flying cars and the idea of iron man back when it was he first came out was was i mean iron man was a disabled right and so part of the iron man suit i think was so that he could he could move around and Boy, still you think be, i you know, would know i don't remember that well anyway i i you know <laughs> it's good like this your omni magazine article made you think and think about science and what was possible and and a lot of our sci-fi now i i don't know just has a different tone what well, does I, I think we're more concerned about it, uh, potential dystopias to a certain extent mm -hmm. but also uh, positive in i don't know some kind of different ways the only other example i could think of in this case just as we're putting those together quickly is uh pixar's Wally mm -hmm. movie, mm -hmm. which uh, not because of my name, I felt an affinity. I actually did not, as much as I, I think there was a great amount of artistry in Wally, the Pixar movie. Uh, it just, it was one of those that was so preachy. It's just hitting you right over the head. You know, there was no, which to a certain extent I actually can't appreciate. It's the subtle preachiness that can be more problematic. But I'll say, for instance, you know, they were clearly going on kind of an anti. Uh, Costco, Sam's, you know, giant mega corporations, right? Because mm -hmm. they, I think they called it by and large. And you have the, you have the, the picture of this devastated earth that essentially this one Walmart type suit company has just clearly turned the earth into a giant trash can. As much as it was super preachy, it did kind of get me thinking a little bit. And, and some of it kind of parroting, if, I hope it's not a spoiler, but essentially you do eventually see humanity has fled earth on these giant kind of cruise liners. But, but, absent all the kind of struggles and difficulties we have in life they're in this giant paradise land that's been created by this giant market this this uh by and large and essentially people have turned into human teletubbies they just mm -hmm. got kind of these bodies like uh anyway this is not in the best shape barely wa they're not even they're walking barely walking. they're just floating on things always they're drinking like, this kind of slurry yeah i was gonna say like that it's like they always just had a giant slurpee they were you know, didn't they have like a video that they could watch at all times I, yeah i think they like did that. they even had personalized video right and uh it, i never know if they called the slurry soylent green or not i was waiting wow. for some kind of gag about that but that, that would have been a where does different the direction. Come from? See, there's another thing, science fiction. <laughs> That's right. So, but, but then it, it, it actually, it was, it was to a certain extent, you could almost call it a satire, I suppose, but not exactly, but science fiction, there you go. It's taking something and it's making an extreme version of it. Kind of like satire does mm -hmm. of something. But an extreme version that you're thinking, okay, that's ridiculous. That's that's never going to happen. But at least can bring into your life, okay, but at the same time, where where is our current society going, right? Where are, what is the limit of this kind of thinking, right? Like if, if that is not 
our future for more than just simply prophetic reasons, mm-hmm. well then, then what is it in yeah. humanity that's going to prevent us from becoming nothing but the Uber consumer? Exactly. Well, I, I loved Wally and I thought it was one of the most poignant because that was Pixar, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was Pixar that, that they ever did because it didn't seem implausible. Like, um, we're like right now we already have a problem where, most Americans and many in the West don't get anywhere near enough exercise, you know, yeah. even global obesity numbers are up and we do, we are, it is kind of a, a consumption type society and we do produce more stuff than we need in some, in some respects. And, and that we could, you know, if you, if you, if humanity could, could pull it together for, you know, another thousand years, you could actually, start to envision a scenario where the earth is just kind of a trash dump. Maybe, maybe not quite the way they depicted it, yeah. but we've had to flee the earth. That that's, that is a thing that, that is, is talked about even now, mm-hmm. the idea that maybe we'll have to leave the earth and, and on these like luxury cruise liners. And you're just like, why even put any effort in when you could just like float around in a little, you know, Jeep a w- thing. Yeah. Like a, wearing a onesie. Yeah. Wearing a onesie. Like an infant. They look like just giant infants, mindless entertainment. And you've kind of lost, in some ways, what humanity is. Right. And so see, that's, that's, that's why I called this a pro because on one hand, if you're going to make that story uh, more realistic and such, we had to think, well, well, exactly how did governments fall and, and weren't there wars? And is it, was it like a, you, you could get kind of complicated versus it's, it's a science fiction kind of story. You just don't have to worry about those details or worry about the plausibility of how these things came to be. And it did get you an opportunity to examine, like for instance, on one hand, yeah, the earth is a giant trash heap in that future. Uh, but it's easy to be hidden from this because we're in the West, but we in the West are simply shipping Mm. a ton of our garbage to other places in the world. Janine was, my wife was highlighting how she read a story about how there are places in the desert where top brands like, like, uh, of clothes are actually when they don't sell are shipped out there because they want to keep the prices high and they can't afford this stuff to just go into like secondhand stores or markets. And if these high fashion things fail to sell, they're simp- there's like places in the desert. They are just dumping these clothes wow. on these massive piles. And, and all, what is a lot of that stuff? It's polyester. It's a lot of plastics. It's just, anyway, on one hand, it's this weird scenario that is doing nothing but feeding our overall kind of market. Right. And a movie like Wally has the potential to get you thinking those kind of thoughts. If you're thinking again with a biblical brain where you're not just looking to be fed mindlessly, but you're looking to wrestle with ideas, mm-hmm. you're looking to actually reflect on humanity. And, and I think that there, there can be a pro with science fiction with some of these I, I really agree because, um, you know, the, what are the questions humanity asks all the time? Well, why is there suffering and why does God allow suffering and why couldn't it be this way or that way or the other? So to me, Wally explores, well, what would happen if we were just babied and coddled, you know, yeah. and, and life was easy and you didn't have to struggle to do anything. Well, we end up like slug like people that don't can, can't even really walk just eating and, and consuming consuming entertainment. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny because the credit sequence for that movie at the end Cause they come back spoiler for those who haven't seen it. They come back to earth and you know, cause a little plant is going to grow. And then during the credits, they're kind of showing society developing again and things are getting green and the people are getting thinner and everything's getting healthier. But I know in my mind watching the credits, I was thinking, boy, what times of struggle and turmoil that would have been. I mean, <laughs> they're the people that can't do anything, mm-hmm. you know, that are suddenly trying to build civilization again. But yet at the same time, it really does highlight and it's so funny, I, mean, I just did a telecast on the problem of evil. And as, as a part of that, I came across uh, John, Hick, uh, John Hick's work in terms of, from a philosophical perspective, it's amazing how he's kind of coming across, well, from the 70s, it's happened in the past, ideas that we've understood from the Bible for a long time, that, that our struggle serves a purpose, a larger purpose. And yeah, you're right, there's a civilization where it's been robbed from them. But at the same time, if you're going to a completely market-based world, what does the market want to do for us? It wants to make your life better. It wants to make your life easier. No one is out there generally. No one's out there marketing product. 
you know, for $14.95, this will make your life more difficult and actually have you working far more than you'd ever have to to achieve the same results. And so, yeah, you see a world that kind of focus on that. And you know, so we don't linger on this point too long. We've got other points to make. Science fiction, because it's allowing itself to be imaginative, can kind of narrow on certain things in some of its story exploration to cause you to think some worthwhile thoughts in a way outside of a context that wouldn't necessarily prompt you to think that way mm -hmm. before. But mm -hmm. all of that said, let's get into some of the cons, Mr. Robinson. There's and so many. There are. And, and I say we have three. I'm looking at our time. I hope we can get to all three. If not, we'll, we'll save one for another time. Like the last one, I think, is kind of vague. But the first one I thought of was when it comes to a science fiction story, and this is true of generally... Uh, well, actually, all these can be true of all fiction, but I feel like there's a kind of special role that you see in science fiction. You're dealing in that case with a universe or just a world, the world of the story, in which the author or writer or the director, or whatever the case is, movie or, or book or something, they are in complete control of reality. And therefore, they control in their little fictional world all cause and effect. And why is that important? Well, that's important because cause and effect, experiencing and seeing cause and effect is how our minds learn from other people's experience what to do and not do. And when you're creating one of these science fiction stories, you're like the, the mini god, if you will, of that story. Your characters live and die at your command. The technology works or doesn't work at your command and you create this world in which you are deciding what the effects are of every cause, which means the stories you have to tell and even the values you want to communicate can be completely disconnected mm -hmm. from actual reality. I, I think really if we could, if we only had time to make one point, oddly, I think that's one of the most powerful points to remember mm. that is entirely somebody's idea of a world and it's their own they've written an actual alternate reality really that in which they can do whatever they want to in it and like consequences suddenly disappear um you, you know like uh well i don't know what details to use so that i don't get censored <laughs> you know but like um well i i actually like one of your examples further down maybe it's a little too early for it no go ahead but but you know, the bridges of Madison County. That's oh, and that's not even science fiction, but exactly right. But that's it's right. the same, it's the same, same idea, principle. which is like, well, they've written a world in which two people had an affair that came to light later and everybody thought it was touching and loving. And it's like, exactly. Mm, you know what? Most of the time it doesn't work out that way. You know, they're just the consequences of the move, things that would normally make people upset or bother them or shatter families are just dismissed and, and unrealistic views of mostly mostly in the in the in the relationships or you know neighbor to neighbor relationship family to family relationship glossed over there can be a world in which two men are living together and they 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 and they're everything's loving great. and wonderful and all this kind of thing and and it's like it it doesn't reflect how things actually work right you know I, i'm glad you said that because it's funny i i do have in my notes uh, the bridges of madison county which is a book it was a movie with meryl streep and clint eastwood and i i've used that example before and i i can't remember who it was that told me they said you know smith do you know how long ago that movie was you really need to come up with some other example mm. but i just remember it impressing me for that very reason i didn't i didn't read it or see it i just was well, you, aware of the you story heard about I, it i heard, heard about it as a big deal it's a great was it a, liter a book first probably yeah it was a, a real popular yeah. book i think and but exactly that was kind of the message of the story was boy adultery can really make some things better can't mm -hmm. it but sometimes right. it's the right way to go and i thought well how how demonic mm -hmm. but that was what really kind of solidified my thought that yeah the author of that book had the freedom to create a world because it's completely fiction where the exact wrong thing produces nothing but good yep. results well so without Without being specific, um, let's go into the hero genre for a minute. Lately, there's been the idea of an anti-hero, right? right? And then it, what's pressed on us is this idea is, well, you know, sometimes you need somebody that's a little dark to come in and, to, and do things, you know? And so it kind of normalizes really not a true hero, but, but then it gets murky as to who's who. I'll give you two other examples. You already mentioned Dune. Here's one of my problems with Dune in, in terms of being unrealistic. 
as a story uh, that comes as a yeah. story. Yeah. Okay. So you have these what 12, 12 noble houses, 12 are the great houses, houses, the great houses in the universe. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, the main one is the Atreides family and they're, they're, noble and they try to do the right thing and we would think of them as good people you know for those who have no idea what we're talking about the science fiction environment here is supposed to be literally more than ten thousand years in the future and it's very feudalistic and so you have home planets scattered throughout mm-hmm. the galaxy that that uh, are kind of like you'd imagine feudal europe yeah. you know and so well so they, you have these different groups that's right? a good way of putting it because like like the atreides are are patterned after like the greeks kind of yeah. So it'd almost be like if you took the U.S., uh, t- took the whole world, and took the various ruling empires and split them out off the earth into empires on their own home worlds. Right. And then right. They, okay. So then you have what are what are really the bad guys, the Harkonnens, and I don't know what the time period is that they're supposed to have been you know had their own ruled their own home planet and been these bad guy Harkonnens. But I'm sorry if it's more than a few hundred years, they won't exist. Like it's not reality that you would have a large collection of bad people that keep working together to fight other people, um, they would collapse in on, on themselves. Right. Like, like I go back to my go-to is um, the Spartans, you know, debatable whether or not they're some of the greatest warriors of all time, but they had some pretty serious problems going on in their nation that I will not get into. Hmm. And one of them is they love to fight. You know what happened? Eventually they didn't have enough men to fight and they got, they got conquered by their, their enemies you wouldn't have a multi thousand and, and this would this goes into other movies as far as i'm concerned these fi- fictitious movies where there's this idea of well there's this ancient amazing empire that lived a thousand years in peace and i'm like well unless human nature has changed they're not going to live a thousand <laughs> years in peace well, like the last 6000 years of human history has shown us that that there's only small pockets here and there for a short period of time where things were were okay or maybe even very good uh, we've, we're actually living in one, have been living in, in one for the last, you know, and even then we still have had plenty of wars and, yeah. and things. Yep. But it's fiction that there's these societies out there that live in peace or have figured it out. Like I, I mentioned in the show prep, Star Trek. One of my problems with Star Trek is it's humanity moving out into the into the stars, moving out into the universe and the galaxy and counting these others. But somehow we don't think about it too deeply. We've left the planet not fighting amongst ourselves. We're a unified federation and we're at peace. We don't really talk about how we've solved our economic and sociopolitical problems. We just have no money because we've yep. somehow figured yep, it figured out. Figured it all out. And and they're out there interfacing and I was like, no, we we was it, was it, I can't remember what there is a sci- sci-fi book I read a long time ago and its point was we would never leave the earth as one unified race we would leave as fighting tribes and I was like <laughs> okay, now that's at least realistic you know Mr. Robinson you are you're actually highlighting a problem with my organization knows today because everything you're saying is exactly things I want to talk about and yet so much that works really well with the third point so I'm going to call an audible okay you know because I, I don't play football. This is the only time I get this to call is an, an audible. Amazon that's promotion. Right. <laughs> that's right. So I'm going to blend point two and point three okay. together here because it. I'm going to make a couple of comments that, that would be more uniquely point two, but man, it really all does. It, it ties into two point three. So the two ideas I had related to the idea that if the author or the creator controls cause and effect and controls his whole world, then what are the kind of messed up circumstances that you can have from that? One of them was actually something I did. I did not read the book, but I, I came across it in a bookstore. I used to just love wandering bookstores, right? And then so much now there's so many terrible things, but, but still I came across a fiction and it was an interesting idea because I had been interested. And if you read my evolution, the evolution book that I wrote, I talk about Neanderthals and, you know, different, different uh, varieties of humans that may have existed. Uh, definitely after Adam and Eve, if they're humans. So we're not talking about trying to validate any kind of uh, prehistoric ideas beyond that. But the, the, if I recall the premise, I don't even know what book series it was. I just remember the premise. The premise was that somehow we or another culture learns how to open up a, uh, a door to a parallel universe. And in that parallel earth and that parallel universe, instead of homo sapiens becoming the predominant strain of humanity, Neanderthals did. And so Neanderthals became the prominent strain. And so somehow the, the two worlds start interacting and working together. And I, serious question. This, this sounds like planet of the apes almost. 
<laughs> no, actually, because Neanderthals actually had far more human-like capacity. Okay. They, they, they're generally they, they may not be as tall, but they were broader. They seem like they could bear more musculature. Mm-hmm. It seems, mm-hmm. but but actually, I think they had a larger brain space. It doesn't necessarily mean that they were smarter. There's a lot more details than size with that. But regardless, no, they were far more human-like than 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 apes. However. Uh, I remember there was there was something that grabbed my attention. I thought it was fascinating. And I, I'm going to get the details wrong. Please forgive me. But it was something like this: that one of the Neanderthal scientists was impressed that because they've been studying each other's culture, we're studying extinct Neanderthal bones. They're studying extinct Homo sapien bones, and the Homo sapien scientist had impressed the Neanderthal scientist because they had figured out that Neanderthals were more likely to be left-handed instead of right-handed. And the scientist says, well, how did y'all even figure that out? All you had were bones and teeth. They said, well, we noticed the teeth on the left side were more likely to be slightly more worn, Hmm. indicating you were working with your left hand Hmm. to, you know, bite some. And he was so impressed, like, oh, that's amazing. Anyway, little things like that I thought were fascinating details to put in. But what I noticed immediately just didn't take long flipping around because they didn't read they didn't read the book was they were using the Neanderthal culture as an alternate human culture where so many things we would consider wrong or perverse were largely accepted morally and were normal. Like the Neanderthal scientist was a male and had a male, uh, uh, we'll just say partner, if you will. Uh, but that but also they were completely amorous with others. Like it was just open, quote unquote, free love. Uh, other elements of their culture and so what is the science fiction author doing? He's trying to say, look at this amazing, just as good as ours world, but with all these relationships that we would consider perverse, but they think are completely normal. Well, because he's the quote unquote little God of that world, when of course he can make all these relationships mm-hmm. work out. He can make all of this, you know, be just fine. And so that was an example. But then also this is I haven't seen a story like this, but I could easily see it. And I wouldn't be surprised if there were stories. I remember, and we may have even talked about it on a podcast, but I remember the New York Times had covered part of this, that with the growth of AI, they're looking at this potential of people uh, fi- you know, having partners, quote unquote, like spouses, if you will, that are really just these AI apps and programs that are chat bots. And, and there was a, I think it was a New York times article. Last time I said, I thought it was a New York times as a wall street journal, but I think this was a New York times about in, in a particular subculture in Japan where people were doing this, you know, they're lonely or whatever. And they're, they're essentially building these fake fictional to building up these fictional characters as if this is their life partner. One guy had even quote unquote married his because they were, they could find software that pretends to be that person in an AI kind of sense. And, and, and the article was talking about how some say it's really, you know, potentially improved their lives, but has it really, but you could easily see a sci-fi guy as AI is growing, trying to create this environment where AI is so realistic, right? It's so, it's just like a person. In fact, I know there are stories like this where they, they truly fall in love. Isn't love between two minds, right? You know, so they create that, but then is it really about AI or are they trying to get you to think in those kind of directions? Like, Mm -hmm. does it make a difference what the other person looks like? Or if they're even human, does it make a difference? Well, in that world, they can make it seem like the most positive thing ever. They can make that AI companion the most loving and the most caring and the person gets over their problems. But again, they're creating that world. It's not a real world. That's not real cause and effect because they're completely in charge. And all the more what you are getting to, to blend in what was going to be the third point, uh, or yeah, third point, especially when they're devoted because most science fiction worlds are a world where what it's all humanism uber alles people are what matters there's no god you really have to worry Mm -hmm. about not in reality and so therefore some of the things they have to say are even contrary to god and the verse that came to mind like you're talking about they can say oh yeah out in the future like in star trek Mankind, it went through hard times, but it solved all of its problems. It doesn't even use money anymore. Like there's tales of the Federation officers like, oh, you use money in your world. That's crazy. Well, Jeremiah 10 and verse 23 highlights to us what Jeremiah says to God. Oh, Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks 
to direct his own steps. And yet the fundamental thing of so many are these, are these sci-fi stories or mankind figuring out his own way mm-hmm. and actually mm-hmm. as if somehow it is in man. That was Gene Roddenberry, the guy that created Star Trek. That's kind of what he wanted was to picture this sort of idyllic future human society yeah. where we are all that. Yeah. What if we could, don't think about it too much, pull our, pull our, get, pull our, get our act together as humanity and go out into the stars and explore. And when they're creating the own result, they can, they can make a fake history like that. And they can create these scenarios where aliens are having difficulties just like we humans used to have. But it's the wise Captain Kirk and his crew. I'm not even trying to knock them, but it's, it's the wise humans who arrive and help them find their way. Well, I watched clips of Picard. Oh, the newer mm-hmm. series on Paramount? Mm-hmm. And it was fascinating because, oddly, they don't try to pretend like morality is any different than it is now. But somehow I think they've given up on some a, of that. Well, yeah. because, you know, it turns out Captain Picard and Dr. Crusher had a child relationship, had a child, and she didn't tell him about it. And it's like the same stuff now. And it's like, so they're just, we're just over it in the future. And, and that's, you, you know... Like all the problems that we have now are problems that they have in the future, but how is it that we just magically all get along together and we don't fight amongst ourselves? Right. We see what we see in the real world. We see small character flaws like that having huge ramifications over time. How is it they survived all of those things? Mm -hmm. Because you know who else also has those problems? Our leaders do, you know, our our, our key influencers in the world. And yeah, it's science fiction. So they don't have to invest in trying to explain the great details of how we figured it all out. But then even if they did in their worlds, they control cause and effect. So whatever their favorite solution, like let's say their favorite solution is um, socialism. Well, they just create a fictional scenario in which finally the world embraced socialism and indeed, we learned it mm-hmm. can work, and it's wonderful. And But let's say it's the opposite. Let's say they believe that it was finally just throwing off all government ties, and it was capitalism. We finally realize it's the individual man who's completely maximized, uh, maximized his freedom to explore his own future. Uh, then once we did that, boy, it was amazing. Once we got government out of the way, everyone got along. But it's your world in science fiction. You can make it seem like that, and you can make it seem like the way of man is in himself, Mm -hmm. the opposite of what the Bible says. We just got to somehow discover it. Yep. You know, one of we're not again, we're not endorsing anything. And maybe you've heard this before, Mr. Robinson, because we talked about it the other day. But it was it was new for me that we we, we've mentioned Dune uh, a few times Mm -hmm. because that's the the. Dune Part Two movie is really, really big in theaters right now. It's made at least half a million dollars, if I recall. It's actually doing financially very well. And I did read the book. I'm not endorsing them for sure. Again, please listen to what it was that Mr. Disclaimer Guy said. But I did read those books when I was younger and when I was uh, in my wayward youth. And uh, Frank Herbert, I will say, the author, I'm not talking about the books that his son wrote later. I know less about them, and I just think he's, I'm not trying to slander the guy, but there's money to be made, and he's got some IP, and so he worked with it. But but with with Frank Herbert, I will give him that he, he, he did create a very uh, rich kind of world, right? I mean, it was the kind of stuff that a lot of people in sci-fi are looking for. They want this kind of detailed world, and it's it, it keeps things fuzzy enough, just enough for you to imagine, kind of like what Star Trek does. They, they make transporters, which everything in physics says really deep down. You should not be able to do that. They'll throw in enough fake words like a uh, Heisenberg compensator to try to be kind of a nod to those who physics know that what well, there's no way that could happen because of, you know, the, the you can't know the velocity of something and it's, its magnitude, all these different things at the same time. So any in its position, ignoring all of that. Herbert does exactly the same thing to create this fantastic world where you don't have to worry about the details. You can just imagine that it's all real. But one person who was not a fan of Frank Herbert's science fiction Dune series was the author J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote the Lord of the Rings series. Now, again, we are not endorsing any of these, but I think the difference in terms of what the man Tolkien had with the Dune books 
I think is fascinating and brings in this kind of idea that a lot of science fiction books, essentially it's kind of a godless world mm -hmm. where you can make it whatever you want. Tolkien, my understanding, I could be wrong, but from what I read, what he really did not like about the Dune series was that unlike what he tried to do with the, the, the Lord of the Rings books that he, that he wrote is he felt that part of what he liked about his own work was he tried to highlight what is good and noble in people and how it's, it's noble for man to struggle against evil and the virtues should be what's celebrated. The virtues that, that, that we long to have should be highlighted as examples. And so he, he was very much tales of, of obvious good fighting obvious evil and tales of, uh, of, of, of that, that really make the heroes virtuous, right? And their flaws were, were actual flaws. But he said, again, as I've read, I don't know if it's accurate or not. I'm not a Tolkienologist because I do think there are people who, who do that. But Frank Herbert's world is not that. It, it, I remember from my days reading it when I was younger, there really, in a sense, is no actual virtue it really is a matter of just simply politics and intrigue mm -hmm. and, and the kind of almost kind of real politic in a sort of kiss and jerk kind of way. Um, it really is just about power and what people do with power. And the closest thing you get to an absolute virtue is the kind of sense that for spoilers for those who might read it. And I, I'm not even saying you should. I'm just, you know, I just keep in mind. I just feel bad about spoiling. You're, stories. you're definitely saying not saying you should. Yeah. yeah thank you very much. Um, but I know by the time I remember I used to see the cover of this book all the time when I was a kid in stores of it looked like a giant worm with a mm -hmm. face. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where you're getting into the fourth book where mm -hmm. Paul's son has become a giant worm mm -hmm. man who has lived for 3000 years. That's why years. I checked out. <laughs> well, I actually remember writing my English paper thesis when I was in high school on that character. But part of the one thing I liked about him was this sense of self-sacrifice. I was really into characters that, 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 that sacrifice themselves for others. But if I, if I look back at it really coldly and I say coldly, I mean in the right kind of way where I'm trying to take my emotions out and bring in the right kind of values, what was his sacrifice? Well, becoming a despotic, terrible emperor of the entire universe for 3000 years. So he could crush mankind so desperately and so horrifically that by the time he finally dies, mankind will become an evolutionary success by, by fleeing his crushing rule out into the stars so that the hard times would come that would force them to be, it's almost like, taking this guy and making him the anti Jesus mm -hmm. who did Jesus Christ in reality did sacrifice himself. But as this humble servant who actually came with love and wanting to help versus this despotic ruler who had to control mankind for three millennia and crush all hope and, and cause fear everywhere. But again, you're a science fiction writer. You can write a story where that guy's choice to become the the universe's worst despot and most bloodthirsty villain for 3,000 years is actually the wise choice, is actually the good guy choice. And that's what we're getting at. That's They can completely ignore reality and do, do yeah. whatever they want. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, some of the press for the movie, they've talked about how can't remember where all this came from but but originally frank herbert was disappointed with fan reaction to dune because people liked paul atreides and ah, that was not really? how he wanted it to be he um and they point out especially when you get to the second book that he's supposed to be a warning of messiahs like, like the messiahs coming along is 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 not a good thing or right you know. and so then he wrote his he wrote his world to be like that that, that it was a bad thing and so in that sense, I mean, it's literally the opposite of, of reality with what the true Messiah has done and the sacrifice he's made. I know you just made that point, but, you know, the other thing, because I completely agree, I'm always reluctant when people want to group the Lord of the Rings series in with others because of that very important distinction. And even um, Canadian author and clinical psychologist Jordan Peterson, <laughs> he was not he's not a, the biggest fan of of um tolkien's work because he thought it was too simplistic too simplistic mm. too what what is he really saying he did not like how clean 
the good and the evil was. And mm. and I, I found that actually one of those things was actually disappointing about his take on it. And, you know, having listened to him a plenty, I can understand why he he's going to be more interested in the nuance and people's flaws and all those kinds of things. But it's not like Tolkien doesn't point out that there are flaws with his characters because right. he does. Mm. But it, it is. I loved it that it had very, very clean, good and evil. Right. And you didn't have to you didn't have to wonder about things. I mean, the only thing was was maybe Saruman, but even then he was kind of a warning about how power and can corrupt people. Interesting. You know, in in terms of sci-fi, I, you know, people people who know me know that I grew up with Star Wars, you know, that that that, that was a big part. I mean, 1977, I was in line like a whole lot of people were, you know, to, to see it. The Plain Truth magazine, way back when, I think even had a, a Empire Strikes Back, I don't know if it was a cover article, but had a main article about the, the sequel, the, the, you know, the second movie's Empire Strikes Back. But that was actually one of the things I like about it too, that actually George Lucas said he was trying to do. Now, of course, he I don't think that he believes in religion, actual religion anyway, I have no idea, but he felt that we, a culture needs stories where there's good guys and bad guys. And so he was trying to make a story in which there were clearly good guys mm-hmm. and there were clearly bad guys. In fact, I remember, and I'm not, I'm not knocking her for this. I mean, in fact, she might even listen to this cause she listens to the podcast, but I remember my future mother-in-law having a critique that I disagreed with though. I understood where she came from and maybe she and Dr. Peterson would be in line here. She didn't like that in the third Star Wars movie, The Return of the Jedi, that the Emperor was so obviously ugly and cruel. And and because she said real evil, and she has a point, real evil doesn't come across as ugly. It comes across as seductively good. It comes across as handsome. And and so she thought the Emperor should have looked not so mm, ugly, yeah. but should have looked more handsome and appealing. And I totally am sympathetic, kind of like maybe in a, in a Jordan Peterson-like way. However... I'm glad he didn't do that because that's not what he was trying to do. He wasn't trying to make the uh, the bad guys are actually good but but seem bad, and the good guys who, uh, sorry, the, the bad guys who are bad but they seem good. No, he wanted good and evil to be blatant. He wanted these things to be kind of obvious. He wanted a simple story for children, really, where there's good guys you root for and they're brave and they're loyal and they 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 love their dad like you know Luke does and even though his dad's a bad guy and the bad guys are bad and you mm-hmm. don't want to be like the bad guys you want to be like the good guys and not everything has to be really subtle so I'll kind of give him credit that he it was a simple story but you know part of what we need are stories that highlight virtues that aren't all that complicated and uh hopefully we don't have to use sci-fi to do it, but if we're rearing children, hopefully we're pointing out to people, you know, exemplars like Jesus Christ is definitely an exemplar, but of various characteristics uh, versus characters that can be more complicated, but then digesting them, you know, for people. So, ah, we've kind of gotten far afield, but hopefully profitably so. Um, yeah, just be aware of that, that when someone is writing, a, and especially science fiction, because it gives you so much room, you don't even have to obey the laws of physics, you literally control everything. The example that I used to give, I'm not sure it's effective, but in my mind, if you want to write in your story, well, as the man picked up the apple, he lifted it off the table, and as he let go of the apple, it stayed suspended in the air with no string, you know, no, uh, just simply hovering over ab- above the table with no X. Ex- you can write that because you're completely in control of that world. And you might think, oh, I understand it's, it's, it's fiction. I understand, but no, your brain is taking mm-hmm. these things in and it does have an impact on you. And most of these guys do have a moral story to tell these yeah. days. They do have something they're trying to convince Well, that's you another of. question though. Um, th- we're grappling with this a little bit in Western civilization now uh, when, when people like uh, Sam Harris are arguing against that there's a God and you know, that we've evolved and all that. It's like, well then where did our morality come from? Right. And they fight against it, but it's difficult to come to anything other than the current morality we have is at least in some way based on biblical standards that go way back. Like our sense of morality actually does. If you trace all the way back is, 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 is as convoluted as it is now where we are, any sense of morality traces back to God. Right. And so like in these others, in these other, doesn't matter, you know, your Star Trek, your Star Wars, whatever. So at least Star Wars has more of an idea of some kind of afterlife, but 
where does your what does any morality come from and why wouldn't it be every man for himself i mean this brings in a number of like you could talk about these for a while but i don't think it's necessary another thing you have to consider in a lot of these sci-fi movies is well what's the, what's the purpose is there some kind of transcendent purpose um if there's no if there's no afterlife and you're just living the life you have, why would you make any kind of sacrifice? I mean, I'm not saying like a, like a family sacrifice, you know, how a mother would, would die for her child. That's kind of baked into us. But um, why would you risk anything for anyone if this is the only shot at life you have? I mean, I right. know that's not, not a new argument. Um, I had one other, one other thing. Well, I guess then if I if there was any kind of warning, and I don't even I hesitate to even call it that, and I would say that this is also, there's another idea I had just a moment ago, but I can understand the lure of sci-fi or some other genres like this because for the, for the boys, for the men, it's, it's the call to adventure and that, man, what if I had these powers, you know, and mm-hmm. what if I was this awesome person, you know, great adventure or whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's, that can be fine, but like it, oh, it can, this, this is a video game tie in. But if we're not careful, it really does hijack hi, hijack our mind and pull us off into a world that's not real and we're not really actually accomplishing anything or becoming better because we live in a... Like, that's the problem. The main problem with video games is if you get too into them, you get all your validation from the video game, which is not real life. You know, thank you, Mr. Robinson, for saying that because we, we do need to wrap up and this brings us into our last kind of point to make. And science fiction can... In terms of, I need to change my kind of early statement that we're going to say one pro and three cons, because I'm not sure officially how many cons we have now. So we're going to make that one pro and some cons. Like the Uh, one from Star Trek? Some cons, con. 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 Oh, (laughs) no, C-O-N, Mr. Robinson. So... In terms of this, you're right. There's something about science fiction worlds and, and, and I'd say adjacent kinds of fiction that have the potential, this is a con, to really suck you in to the point where if you're not careful, especially when you're young, you can find yourself interacting with that world and the fictional things of that world even more than you are in the real world. And I, I appreciate that you mentioned... Uh, uh, video games is an example of that as well, because that is a real danger of that. And if anything, with video games, they're designed to do that, mm-hmm. right? They're designed, they're, they literally have psychologists yep. and such working yep. for them to try to suck you into that world. Well, it's not just video games. Nowadays, it can't just be movies anymore, and it can't just be books. They want a larger media empire. They want, they want uh, other, there's games for you to play. There's, there's a, uh, well, toys, if you're really young, but you know, these days don't be really long with, 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 with some others, but regardless, it is designed to, to bring you into that world. And let me, let me use sports as an example, because that might seem like the opposite of this in some ways. It's like, oh, you know, whether it's uh, geeks and athletes mm-hmm. or whatever, but you know, I, I've known a lot of people who love sports. In fact, I'm sitting across the table from one. Mr. Robinson likes likes at least some sports. Well, Offici- right, Mr. Robinson? No, no, I love lots of sports. I've I've officially checked out of the NCAA tournament, which is going <laughs> on right now. I just I don't care anymore. They, the college students don't stay long around very long. Now there's a lot of money and everything. It's just Interesting. Not anymore. Well, let me let me then highlight Mr. Robinson as someone, at least best I can tell, unless y'all know something about him, I don't. Who has a healthy relationship with sports? It's an interest. He can talk about it. I think I've heard you talk with uh, Ben Graham, I think, at times on sports. Mm-hmm. I know I've heard yeah. you talk sports. Sometimes uh, it goes hockey. And I have to... uh, you got it. You got it. Well, you, you're kind, you know. Mm-hmm. But I've and I know you you will touch base with some podcasts mm-hmm. and some others. So definitely it's it's a hobby. It's an interest that you invest in and that it does actually uh, uh, lubricate the gears, lubricate the gears of conversation with others who are also interested. There's a real and not not false joy that comes from talking with someone else about things you both enjoy. Yes. And there's nothing wrong with investing that as long as it's not a sinful thing, there's nothing wrong with that. It can be a good thing. However, I've also known individuals in my life and have seen at a distance, some that are way too into like Mr. Robinson talk about his frustration with the final four. But have you ever, that is in terms of basketball and this being March Madness, but have you ever known some who go so far, it takes over their whole life. Mm -hmm. They can't think of anything else. Sometimes their family is suffering. There's investments they should be making in the real concrete world 
that affects other people in their lives and they're not, they're spending all of that time and energy investing in, in, well, in this. And, and so it, it's interesting because a lot of where sports has gone today, um, this is not so much what you see in with, even with church members, for example, but betting is huge now. It's, oh, it's just advertised yeah. everywhere. There's I've seen a lot of podcasts like sports used to just be about sports. Now you have podcasting episodes that talk about the lines for the upcoming games. You know, the, mm. the, the, the if you kids don't know that's good um <laughs> but th- now now a lot of talk is can be oriented towards gambling and gambling adjacent things but also literally called fantasy sports now so as not to be a hypocrite i i participate in one fantasy league i do a football league but it doesn't take a lot of time yet at, to your point people can become obsessive about it and then they're in a lot of leagues and in uh. every sport you know, and you can just be around the clock all year long because of the sports schedule goes wow. you know, year round. And um, that's another way you can get pulled into something that can take up a lot of your time not, okay. and not profitably in that way. Well, good. Well, that that's that's validating. Thank you, because I thought sports would be a good analogy as something that's not evil in and of itself. But you can you get caught up. Well, science fiction can be the same way. Look, again, I People know that I grew up with Star Wars and that it was, you know, that it was something important to me when I was young in terms of the what I enjoyed and and, uh, uh, the fiction that I enjoyed. But that said, it's one thing to really enjoy something a lot and to be able to talk with others who enjoy it and have a good conversation, even to talk about, oh, I wish George Lucas had done this or I can't believe they're I can't believe Disney is ruining it, you know, in all these other ways. I I enjoy those conversations. But at the same time, I, you can invest so much in something that, that, yeah, you could, you could go at the drop of a hat and talk about how, you know, the way that the physics of Kyber crystals, uh, really helps to regulate how a lightsaber functions in this way or this way. And here's the, and, and what you can color it is and exactly. You can be invested in those kind of things so much yeah. when in reality there are no Kyber crystals but there are real people and real things in the world and there's real places that you can go and we have to make sure we're balanced because the creators of this media, they don't care if we're balanced or not. In fact, if we want to spend all of our time and money in the worlds that they create, mm-hmm. they will take yeah. every single they dollar and to second accept we your have. Donation. That's exactly right. So it's, it's there's something about these kind of fan, fantastic worlds that are created that really can draw people into the point where they 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 risk doing what I think Mr. Weston called once living life as an avatar. Well, instead of not, I don't mean like the movie Avatar. Mm-hmm. I mean like an icon that's that's fake as opposed to being you and learning how to be you in the real world. Yeah. Well, you just reminded me of Harry Potter. Um, Didn't read any of the books, saw clips of some of the movies, but, you know, Jordan Peterson, since I already mentioned him, I can, I can mention him again. Um, (laughs) He thinks that that whole phenomenon is fascinating because he says anytime something is written by somebody that makes her richer than the queen talking about the author. <laughs> we should we should at least study that and understand why. But you know Harry Potter at its peak was just absolutely huge and people were obsessed by it. It and, was crazy. And and all wanting to live in this fake, you know, Hogwarts style world and everything and that was that was a great example of just leaving reality behind and wanting to live in an, in an alternate universe that would never happen in a million years. And, and, and in a world where, what is the world starting to say? Hey, you know, live and let live, man. You know, mm-hmm. Hey, yes, this guy has his, his, uh, his, his, he has no, he has no uh, family or friends or anything. All he has are these fictional characters mm-hmm. from Hogwarts or whatever. But hey, if that's if that's his jam, you know, that's his jam. And, and God would say, no, I actually want to give you in the future the real universe, the actual universe. But to give you that, I need I need you to yeah. learn how to live in this one now, the one that I gave you, not the one that J.K. Rowling made it. We could almost do a whole podcast on themes that are in a lot of that. They're, not all of them, but you see these themes in various ones. And for example, so not just not just Harry Potter, but I we've noticed this in other science fiction works. There's no parents. And right. Not uncommon, and, and but somehow the kids successfully navigate through everything and figure it out, sometimes on their own. Even. Yeah. So, anyway. Yeah. The, you know what? We, 
Wow. Okay, maybe we, we put we'll put a bookmark for this one because that is a great idea. Maybe we should do a podcast on the the uh, kind of like Disney, the the wonderful world of parentless children, yes. which is really a vast fiction world. Oh wow, Miss Robinson. Okay. Instead, we need to wrap up because someone's about to be downstairs yeah. to pick us sure. up. Uh, how do we want to wrap up on this? Again, it would be hypocritical for us to say that, oh, you know, just never, you know, don't enjoy any sci-fi. We have enjoyed various little stories here and there. We we certainly have. However, there's never an excuse, never, never, never to not have your biblical thinking brain on. You want to keep in mind how even your fiction is impacting you and the thoughts that it's stirring in you. And you want to watch or listen or read to things with your biblical brain engaged and thinking, asking, well, how would Jesus Christ even think about this? You know, what, 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 what are the thoughts I should have? Not just what are the thoughts they're leading me to have. And I, I can't help it whether it's, I, I do think it's directly related because some of you out there are trying to make choices about your entertainment, whether it's science fiction or anything else. And I thought, how can I beat going out with the Bible verse? Uh, and so Mr. Aguin, when he was asked spokesman club once about how do we make decisions about our our choices in terms of fiction and entertainment. He didn't kind of go to some blanket thing one way or the other. He didn't go to, uh, oh, you know, always do this or don't do this. He, uh, go figure, he pointed us to the Bible, Mr. Robinson. And he pointed us specifically, as I mentioned at the beginning, to Philippians 4.8. And he said, let this be your guide in making those choices. And I think, how can we do better than leaving you with the same thing? What does the Apostle Paul write to us in Philippians 4.8? He says, finally, brethren, he doesn't say teens and young adults, but you're in there too. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And we recommend you do just that.